Hello everyone. My name is Dai Chi, and I will give you the lecture, regarding the radiation and remediation activities. So, let's start today's lecture. Today's theme is, radionuclides released due to the accident of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Are you ready? Hello, Hikari. Are you looking up something? Hello, Mr. Daichi. Yes, I am now looking up something about the accident of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. However, I have a trouble finding out what kind of radionuclides are released into the environment at that time. Okay, I see. You remind me that I said in another lecture that I would talk about it. This is a good opportunity, so I will explain it now, if you don't mind. First of all, allow me to come to the conclusion. There are a lot of kinds of radionuclides released into the environment after the accident. Of which, we need to especially care about following three kinds of radionuclides. They are, iodine-131, cesium-134, and cesium-137. Other than that, it was found out, that xenon-133, strontium-90, plutonium-238, 239, and 240 were released. However, it has become apparent, that these radionuclids have made less impact, compared with radionuclids which I mentioned earlier. Let me elaborate further the detail. For example, in the case of the accident of nuclear power plant, if the gaseous radionuclids are released into atmosphere, with very high temperature, and they dispersed in the form of radioactive plume, which is similar to clouds. And once they are cooled in the atmosphere, part of the radionuclids are converted into fine liquid or particulate solid, and travel with wind, followed by the deposition onto the ground. And part of the radionuclids are also deposited onto the ground with rainfall. So, let's go into detail of each radionuclide. First of all, the amount of xenon-133 was so large, but physical half-life is very short, compared with other radionuclids, and it has low boiling point and melting point. Therefore, it means that we need to care about direct exposure from xenon-133 in radioactive plume, especially shortly after the accident. However, they are not deposited onto the ground and the influence by xenon becomes less, comparatively in a short period of time. The next one is iodine-131. Iodine-131 has comparatively short physical half-life, that is, 8 days. It has, however, the characteristic to accumulate in thyroid. So we need to care about it. I would like to explain the health effect caused by iodine-131, in another lecture. For the next, cesium-134, and 137. These radionuclids have boiling point of 678 degree, and melting point of 28 degree. Therefore, under the high temperature circumstances, where the nuclear fuels are melted, they become gaseous and easy to be released into environment. However, if the temperature decreases down to less than 28 degree, they become particulates and they are deposited onto the ground and contaminate it. Especially, cesium-137, has long half-life. 30 years, so it causes impact for a long time in the environment. Next one is strontium-90. This is also a radionuclide to be cared about, like radioactive cesium, in terms of chemical substance. But, it has become apparent, that the amount released into environment was very small, and the concentration in the environment is same or less than that monitored before the accident. The last one is, plutonium-239. Its physical half-life is around 24,000 years, so it causes impact for a very very long time. However, the boiling point is very high and it is less volatile. Therefore, it tends not to be dispersed into broad area. In addition, same as strontium-90, 
it has become apparent that the amount released into environment was very small, and the concentration in the environment is same or less than that monitored before the accident. At last, let me elaborate the other characteristics of three kinds of radionuclides, which we need to especially care about. First of all, iodine-131 has a relatively short effective half-life, but it has a characteristic to be likely to accumulate in thyroid. Therefore, especially shortly after the accident, we need to pay attention to the exposure by beta ray and gamma ray. The meaning of effective half-life will be explained in another lecture. For the next, radioactive cesiums. They don't accumulate in particular tissues, an effective half-life is around a couple of months. The difference of physical half-life is as explained earlier. So, from long-term perspective, especially we need to care about cesium-137, and the types of emitted radiation of beta and gamma rays. Okay, I see. Each radial nuclide has each characteristic, like physical half-life. So, the measures against each radial nuclide are different. So, let me wrap up my lecture by providing you the key points. Today I explained that various kinds of radionuclides were released into the environment, due to the accident of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. However, each radionuclide has its own characteristic, such as physical half-life, chemical characteristics like boiling or melting point, and the amount released into environment is also different between radionuclides. Of which, iodine-131, which is more likely to accumulate in thyroid, and radioactive cesiums, which are likely to accumulate in whole body, need to be cared about. Especially cesium-137, which has relatively long physical half-life, needs to be cared about, from the long-term perspective. Okay, today's lecture is now dismissed. See you next time. In this channel, the useful information, regarding the radiation and remediation, will be provided to you. If you like it, please subscribe to this channel, and do not forget to click the like button.